Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Huda Abadi. I'm the Associate Director at the Carter Center. On behalf of the Center, I want to welcome you all to our panel on the growing threat of white supremacy. This conversation is taking place in parallel with the Carter Center's International Symposium on Countering Islamophobia towards more effective strategies and solutions, which started today and ends on Wednesday. We are incredibly fortunate to have with us two distinguished panelists joining us today, both experts on the history and ideology of white supremacist groups in the United States. I would first like to introduce Mr. Arnaud Michaelis. 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 There you go. I wanted to get it right. From the age of 17, Arnaud was deeply involved in the white power movement. He was the lead singer of the race metal band and founding member of what became the largest racist skinhead organization in the world today. Today, he is a motivational speaker, author of My Life After Hate, a memoir of his disengagement from the white power movement, and an advocate of Serve to Unite, an organization that engages young people as peacemakers. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, we are delighted to also have with us Dr. Heidi Byrick. Dr. Byrick leads the Southern Poverty Law Center Intelligence Project and is an expert on the various forms of extremism, including white supremacist, nativist, neo-confederate movements. She oversees SPLC's yearly count of the nation's hate groups and is a frequent contributor to SPLC's investigative reports. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I would like to start today by noticing that the so-called alt-right, including a variety of white supremacists, anti-Semitic, anti-Muslim, and militias groups have increasingly moved into the mainstream. We have seen that the most obvious example that we have seen was last month in Charlottesville, Virginia, unfortunately, and it became the site of an extended white supremacist revival meeting where several counter-protesters were injured and one um, Unfortunately, Ms. Heather Heyer was murdered. Mm -hmm. And that same weekend, but less reported by the press, Jerry Drake Farnell, a member of the Third Percenters, a well-known militia and form of anti-government activism closely close with the uh, uh, white supremacist, anti-Semitic, and Islamophobic ideologies, was arrested in Oklahoma City for attempting to detonate a thousand pound bomb in Oklahoma, but we have not heard as much about it. Uh, the Triangle Center on Terrorism and Homeland Security reported that in June 2016 that, quote, law enforcement agencies in the United States consider anti-government violent extremists, not radicalized Muslims, to be the most severe uh, threat of political violence that they face, end of quote. Yet most of the PVE, CVE work has been limited exclusively to Muslim context, which is problematic, and it's something that I would like to talk to you about towards the end of the panel. So Arno, I would like to start talking with you about what, what uh, can you share a little bit about your personal experience? What was the appeal of white power movement? What attracted you to this group? And at the same time, what made you want to leave them? For me, it was um, really like the, the repulsion that civil society had for swastikas. I was, um, as a 16 year old kid, I was already, I'd been violent for a long time. I was a bully on the school bus as a little kid. I, I kind of had developed a habit of lashing out and getting stimulation from that, like getting a kick out of causing trouble of any sort. And like any other kind of habit, what gets you off the first time, 10 times later, is old hat, so you have to keep escalating the antisocial behavior. And my antisocial behavior escalated up until I was a teenager when I was drinking myself. I came from an alcoholic household, uh, which is really kind of where my suffering came from that made me angry and made me start lashing out. And uh, I, I, like many teenagers, I... I I think all teenagers have that feeling of like, oh, I hate you. Like just at least once in their life, you know, they get this range of hormones and frustration and everybody goes through that. But for me, that feeling of, oh, I hate you is like just another kind of rush. And I'm like, yeah, and then I hate society and I hate school and I hate cops and I hate the government. And so now I'm just like getting off on hate and I'm getting off on violence. And then I hear white power skinhead music that, 
is like rife with that theme and it's justifying all this hate and violence that I'm already very familiar with. And it's telling me that I'm feeling this hatred for society because my people, the white race, are under attack by this shadowy Jewish conspiracy that's been going on for thousands of years. And everybody who's not white is part of this plan to like wipe out all the white people and the media is part of it and the government's part of it and the cops are part of it. And all the, like, the bigger this conspiracy is, the more like my role as a hero fighting it is, is appealing. Because now I'm like, it's not a big deal if you're not facing this some gigantic ominous foe. It, it's, it's not as romantic. It's not as seductive. So the, the more dire the circumstances were relayed to me, the more it appealed to me to be that hero to come in saving my people. Plus, it really made people angry. It really, like, it gave me the rush to be, like, outside of society and, and to be this kind of elite us against this gigantic kind of nebulous, ominous them that was coming to get us. It was this us versus them narrative that uh, appealed to me and, and made it interesting and made my sense of self-worth uh, seem to be valid. I, looking back, I think it was a very false sense of self-worth. But um, it, it, at the time, it made me feel like I was important, I was a hero, I was doing something. And because... Uh, it's a relatively shallow pool when you're dealing with a group of so few people to, to rise above the top of that pool isn't a big deal. So within the movement, I was a leader of the Northern Hammerskins. I was a reverend in the Church of the Creator. I was the lead bellower of a hate metal band that had sold a bunch of records. And outside of the movement, I was an alcoholic high school dropout who printed t-shirts for minimum wage. So it, it, it gave this really big sense of importance and who I was. And um, that's what made it all the more difficult to leave. Because I even when I got to the point after seven years where I was so exhausted, I wanted to leave and I was looking for an excuse to do that. It was still like I, I couldn't just do it without an excuse because I would be leaving everything I knew. It was the only way I knew how to think. It was the only friends I had. It was like I had concocted this identity, staked in that ideology, and once that's gone, like who am I? I, I was very afraid to, to face that. Uh, fortunately for me, I, I did become exhausted to the point where I was looking for an excuse to leave, and in my case, that excuse came in the form of single parenthood. I became a single parent to my 18 month old daughter um, in 1994. Go figure, but hate and violence isn't really conducive to a healthy relationship between a man and a woman. So her mom and I split up and a couple months later, a second friend of mine was murdered in a street fight. And by that time I'd lost count how many friends had been incarcerated. So it finally hit me like if I didn't change my ways, death or prison was gonna take me from my daughter. And that became like the aha moment. And um, I, I left the movement in 1994. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your personal story. And also speaking a little bit about the, you know, the dangers of when we dehumanize and, other, and otherize an entire community, how it becomes so much easier to hate. What would you say to young people who might be listening right now mm. and who are attracted to this kind of discourse where they feel that they finally have this some type of power because uh, they are nobodies, but they are someone in within that this group. What would you tell to them? Well, it, it's, it's an easy way out. It's really, it's a coward's way out. It's like rather than looking at your own life and being like, How, what can I do better to improve my life? It's really easy to be like, it's the Jews' fault. It's the gays' fault. It's the most, it's, it's easy to rattle down that list. The, the really tragic thing about this is when you cut yourself off from the rest of humanity you're missing out on, on all of this life experience that can be had when you are not terrified of the rest of the people on earth i get asked uh quite often like are you ever going to go back do you ever kind of have like moments where you're thinking like you used to and the answer is like i wouldn't go back with a gun to my head because living like that sucks that stuff is going to work out when you are terrified your, your every waking moment. Whereas if you are 
curious and interested in the rest of the world and you're ready to engage with people and you're ready to listen to them and learn from them, all those things are going to be enhanced. And, and it's simply, it's going to lead to your happiness and success. The hate and violence will lead to your misery. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Byrick, you have, you've been following movements like this for a while now. And how do you, we come to understand the current rise in white supremacy groups? I mean, variations of these groups have been around for over a century or so, but why do they suddenly seem to be much more visible? Are we in a new form of uh, this form of extremism? Well, you said rightly that, you know, the United States has been home to white supremacy, you know, forever, forever and ever. Yeah. Founded as a white supremacist nation, most white people were white supremacists, you know, until the end of the civil rights movement. So we have to keep that in mind, <clears throat> just that there's this historical basis there. You know, the, the Southern Poverty Law Center has been counting hate groups since the 1980s, and there has been a serious shift. So, for example, all through the 1990s, the numbers of hate groups would be a little bit over 450 and a little under. In other words, it was kind of no pattern for a while. They, they bounced around the 450 number. And then in the year 2000, the number of hate groups started to grow. Uh, and from 2000 until the current year, 2016 is the last time we counted, almost that entire period the number of hate groups was climbing. Not every single year, but in general the trend line was up. And what happened in 2000 is a critical thing from the point of view of hate groups. That's the year that the American uh, Census Bureau said that white people will become a minority in the United States in the 2040s. In other words, there'll be no majority population. And these folks knew that that was essentially their death sentence if they didn't do something to stop it. So, you know, David Duke was immediately talking about the dangers of immigration, where his focus used to be slightly different before. Klan groups shifted from complaining about black people to complaining about immigrants because they got that the demographic issue is really about the Mexican American or Latino uh, population growing mm -hmm. and whites diminishing in relation to that. So we've had some seminal things happen uh, in the last 17 years on this front. That was a big one with the Census Bureau talking about increasing diversity and demographic change in the U.S. We also had a massive financial crisis, obviously, mm -hmm. in 2007 and 2008. Mm -hmm. And we do find that a decent, well, I'll say this, economic insecurity can help feed people into movements mm -hmm. like this. But of course, all kinds of um, you know, troubling movements, but also white supremacy. And then we had the election of Barack Obama. So every one of these things helped to build the ranks of white supremacists in this country because they were reasons to get organized in a backlash against what was going on, a backlash against this demographic change, a backlash against insecurity, economic insecurity, and a definite backlash against a black person in the White House. Mm -hmm. That was sort of the last straw. So those, those three big meta things that happened in the last 15 years or so matter. If, if we look at a narrow time period between 2015 and 2016, we also saw a jump in the number of hate groups, so I think it was maybe about 30. Uh, but there was a definite thing happening between those two years. That is the, you know, between the time that Donald Trump announced his run for presidency and uh, that's like the entire period of his campaign. Mm -hmm. And what we saw in that time period is that groups that attached themselves to Donald Trump began to grow in the real world. So we've had these kind of mega trends feeding this backlash, or a lot of people call it a white lash, right, against what's happening in the US. But then the specific issue of the campaign and some of the appeals that Trump made also has added fuel to this fire. Okay, thank you. Um, and how are these issues discussed within the white supremacy movement, uh, according to Heidi's analysis? in terms of demographic change, uh, feeling like they're losing power. Yeah, that's the, the bread and butter. It's it, Back in my days, which is the late 80s, early 90s, we would talk about demographic change then. And we would do it in terms of birth rate. And I, it, in, it's important to understand that all violent extremist narratives will have like little shreds of truth that they bring and like kind of twist and, and pervert into their ideology. In, in the case of birth rates, it's true that globally, the birth rate for white people is, back in the 80s and 90s, I don't know what it is currently, but it was like about break even back then. 
So we weren't like making more white people. It was about just as many being born as that were dying. And um, the birth rate of black people was higher. The birth rate of Latinos was way higher. The birth rate of Asians. And so we would point to that and be like, we're going to be outnumbered. We're going to be kicked out of our own country. We're gonna, they're going to be coming to get us. It would never acknowledging like they want to, they're going to treat us like we've been treating them for 500 years. Um, it, but those, anything where you can kind of get your hooks of fear into somebody, that's where you want to go. Birth rate was a great thing. Um, economic problems. Who, why are these economic problems happening? Well, it's the Jews. The Jews are doing this to, to take all the money from the white man and give to these lazy minorities and immigrants who don't work. And I, I, a lot of these are like pure falsehoods that anybody who goes through the modern world knows are false. But again, it's easier to accept these falsehoods than to accept the uncomfortable truth of like, maybe I need to better myself to get a better job. It's, it's much easier to blame Jews or blame some kind of ridiculous conspiracy theory as to why things are going wrong. As far as President Obama goes, um, I recall I campaigned for President Obama in 2008. I was just all about <laughs> it was the first it was the most politically active I'd ever been. Um, so I and I, I still love President Obama. I, I think he uh, was an amazing president, a very dedicated man. He wasn't perfect, but nobody is, but. Uh, as far as hate groups are concerned, that was he was a huge gift to them as well because now they can. It's not only rhetoric; it's like, look, they are taking over the White House, and they being blacks, but also this like shadowy. He's a secret closet Muslim as well. Yeah. Um, that that kind of fear cultivation is is what white supremacist and really any kind of violent extremist narrative depends on. So when, when there can be real world happenings that can be kind of spun, and it, like any, any other kind of political thing, if you watch a, a right wing political show, they're going to be spinning everything to suit their narrative. If you watch a left wing political show, they'll spin everything to suit their narrative. White supremacists spin everything to suit their narrative. And in, in the last 17 years, there's been a lot of things happening that they made a lot of hay of. So apologies for the technical difficulties. We are back. Um, Heidi, I wanted to ask you, we've seen during the presidential campaigns anti-Muslim bigotry uh, was at an all-time high, and it really became an okay form of bigotry. Basically, it became mainstreamed. Is there any correlation in your work where you have seen during and after the presidential campaign where there has been a rise of hate groups and which types of groups? Yeah, well, the category that grew the most between 2015 and 2016 on our hate group list was the anti-Muslim category, okay. anti-Muslim organizations. And there's no question that this was fueled by the rhetoric of the campaign, right, in particular by the Trump campaign. So the number of those organizations basically tripled. They went from around 30 in 2015 to 101 in 2016. We saw massive growth in this sector. New organizations that came out of nowhere, uh, chapters that pop, you know, popped up for organizations that didn't have chapters before, and they read, you know, they rode the campaigns rhetoric about Muslims as terrorists, Muslims as dangers, anti-refugee sentiment, which was obviously one of the mm -hmm. issues at that time, mm -hmm. right, with folks coming from Syria and so on, uh, you know. As of uh, 2016, anti-Muslim organizations represented one-ninth of all of our hate groups. That's kind of a big deal in a country with a history of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. For example, we listed 100 white nationalist groups. These are sort of racists in suit and ties. We had more anti-Muslim groups than we had that. So it was an astounding uh, phenomenon. And look, we know that elections fuel um, vitriol and anger at populations, and they can they can lead to increasing extremism. And the Trump campaign took advantage of that to, to get votes, and this was the horrible outcome of that tactic. The FBI and the Department of Homeland Security in May of this year warned that white supremacist groups have already carried out attacks more than any other domestic group over the past 16 years. And an independent database compiled by the investigative fund at the Nation Institute also found that between 2008 
In 2016, far-right plots and attacks outnumbered any other incidents almost two to one. By all accounts, the growth of white supremacist groups represents a real threat to national security. Heidi, what are the federal and local governments doing to monitor and combat these groups, and how are they recruiting, and how can this recruitment be thwarted? Well, you know, you're asking a fabulous question, because the truth of the matter is that our own officials in Washington, D.C. couldn't tell you how many FBI agents in the counterterrorism section are devoted to combating white supremacists, for example, or what the staffing is at the Department of Homeland Security for these issues. There is a complete lack of information on this front. And I think it goes back to a fundamental problem we have. Even though everything you said is right, the data that you said is right about right-wing attacks, there has been an incredible reluctance on the part of our government to admit that that kind of thinking is just as much generative of domestic terrorism as, you know, Daesh or other forms of, you know, extremist interpretations of Islam. There's this idea in this country, and, and this is a, a narrative that's been around since 9-11, that you have some kind of worldwide Muslim extremist, you know, actions that are trying to destroy the Western world, all motivated from the same set of ideas. Mm -hmm. It's a false narrative, mm -hmm. but every time there's an attack, whether it's Manchester or Nice or something else, it's all seen as of a piece. Mm -hmm. Right, and terrorism has come to be defined that way. Right, mm -hmm. it where it has a Muslim face, mm -hmm. but it doesn't accord with the facts. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were to be honest about terrorism within inside the borders of the United States, you'd be spending at least fifty percent of your resources battling militia types, sovereign citizens, white supremacists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we're not doing that, or at least we don't have any evidence that we're doing this. And and I think, you know, when you start to wonder why. Why would this be, given the numbers that you have, given that cops are more afraid of militia types than they are of others? You know, I think that there is just a very deep reluctance to look at our own culture, mm -hmm. right, as a source for violent extremism and for terrorism. Where, where does white supremacy come from? Well, it doesn't come from some foreign country that you could sort of other and say has, you know, nothing to do with me. It's indigenous. It's an American ideology that came with the founding of the country. And there just seems to be this incredible reluctance to admit what this can produce. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and that really sits there because why else would you be so mysterious about what are the FBI resources or the DHS resources? Mm -hmm. why, what's the problem with saying, well, we can have two kinds of things that fuel terrorism, right? It could be white supremacy and Daesh. What's the big deal? Right? Why would there be such a reluctance to just say what I just said? You know, this isn't this isn't about facts, right? I think there's a real reluctance on the part of white Americans to admit that something that is in our history could be as deadly as something from some foreign country that it's easy to act as, you know, act as nothing to do with America. Thank you. You actually touched on a very critical issue that relates to our work as well. And you t specifically the double standards of terrorism and how we get to define it and who gets to get the label of the terrorist, right? It's much easier to say the Muslim is the terrorist, you know, he's, he or she is the boogeyman, especially if they look visibly Muslim. But it's most more of a lone wolf attack, mentally ill, if, and it's separate incidents. It's not an ideology if it's a white, uh, if, it's, if it's not Muslim, and if it's especially if it's white. Um, Arno, even though the white supremacy groups represent the largest threat to national security, Trump administration just defunded uh, groups that prevent and counter white supremacy, ideology, and violence. Mm. Given these challenges, really, how can we like push for a policy change, but also change and shift the paradigm on the understanding of terrorism in the first place? I, the last part of that, I think, is what's most important because <clears throat> so far, I think there's there's too much of a lowest common denominator approach. Uh, I have a dear friend named Hector in New York City. What's up, Hector? Uh, him and I talk a lot, and we talk about issues like race and politics and terror and things like that. And I asked Hector, I'm like, you know, how come everybody is so like they want they want to call Dylan Roof a terrorist? They want to call everybody a terrorist instead of saying like well, why don't we call them all human beings? Why don't we understand that they're all like suffering people who are hurting and that's why they do this rather than trying to drag everybody down. Let's try to lift everybody up. 
And Hector said, because it, it, people just want equal treatment. And if the quickest way to do that is to drag everybody down, then that's what we're going to do. Hmm. And I, I think that's that's been the approach to terrorism is, is everybody's calling. Is we, we want to call it all terrorism without asking why it happens and how human beings reach a point where they think going out and killing a bunch of people is a good thing. So in my experience as a counterviolent extremism consultant, I've discovered that all human beings have an equal capacity to harm or to heal. And anytime we lose sight of that, we are amplifying violence. We're, we're validating the narratives of violent extremism. It's, it's, I agree that as a country, we, don't, we have a hard time doing that. It's much easier to say, well, it's the Muslim, they're the dangerous ones. The religion's dangerous by itself without saying, no, we've been pretty dangerous ourselves since this country was founded. Um, so I think it's very important to make that point that it's an equal threat, but then also think about where do we want to go from here? Do, do we want to, I'd see uh, progressive friends on social media going like, no, see, this is what we really should be afraid of. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, how about we just say, let's not be afraid of any of them because that's what they want us to do. Mm -hmm. All terrorism is, in tactical terms, it's a force multiplier. Mm -hmm. It's a way for a much smaller force to control a, a numerat, as far as numbers are concerned, a superior force. And that's what's been happening since 9-11. The entire face of the earth has been changed by a relatively tiny, tiny group of terrorists. And that trend has continued to the point where we have all of civil society reacting and moving according to what terrorists do rather than letting us control the conversation and saying like look these guys are criminals we're going to treat them like criminals we're going to put law enforcement where it needs to go and, and answer that question how many fbi agents do we have on white supremacist far-right violence but then leave it at, at that rather than letting them change the way that we see each other in norway a man named anders breivik murdered 69 people on an island most of them teenagers and then he killed uh eight more people with a bomb in oslo so this guy murdered 77 people but norway still said we're gonna send him to the longest sentence we can sentence anybody to 21 years and a lot of people are up in arms about that going how can you how can you not give him the death penalty how can you not send him some for 10 life sentences like we do in the states here and the Norwegian people said, because we're not going to change our principles about justice in, in a restorative approach rather than a punitive approach. So anytime I'm discussing terrorism, I, I'm going to agree that as far as threats go, it's, it's certainly an equal, if not greater threat from uh, far right white supremacist groups as opposed to terrorists in Islamic clothing. But let's not let both either of them control how we act and how we treat each other as a country. We, we need to aspire to, to a higher level, and that's the antidote to the, the mechanics that drive people into either of these groups, which, by the way, are completely symbiotic. Mm -hmm. When, when uh, there's a so-called Islamic State attack, all the far-right guys are like, oh, yeah, ka-ching, ka-ching, and, and vice versa. When there's a, an attack from the far-right, the Islamist groups and, and also people on the far-left are like, oh, ka-ching, ka-ching. Like, that, proved, that validates my political narrative. So instead of like, hey, that scores, like, let's really think about the people who die in these attacks and the families that are destroyed and the people who are still suffering and then respond with compassion and understand that the people committing the violence are doing that because they're suffering which doesn't mean it's okay, and it doesn't mean we're not going to stop them in the future, but it does mean that we we got to get away from this punitive approach to justice that is literally destroying our country. Um, I'm going to push you a little bit, a little bit Please on, do. Um, on, and since the, on what you just mentioned, I know we've had discussions earlier during the day, and you spoke a lot about rehabilitation, forgiveness, and being able to look at humanity and compassion, which is all very good. Sure. But the number one brunt of the victims of the war on terror after 9-11 has been the Muslim community who has been scrutinized, who has been always called terrorist, who has been uh, you know, uh, surveilled uh, and monitored, divided. So for many of these people, in, for many in the community, 
it's very important. They say you need to call it as it is. We, our entire faith has been scrutinized as, you know, this is an ideology right. that because you're Muslim, then there's a risk that you might become radical. And I think this is where the Bush push comes from because there is not, there is not a lot of coverage on the threats of white supremacy within the United States or Europe. Most of the media's focus has been on Muslims and within the Muslim context. So you find these Muslims basically, uh, you know, double victims. On the one hand, right. you have Daesh, and the number one victims of Daesh have actually been Muslims right. within the MENA region. Mm -hmm. And then on the other, you have, you know, the Islamophobes who, you know, there's hate crimes, there's mosques vandalized, there's murders of young people, and we've just seen uh, the young woman who was murdered in, uh, in, uh, uh, after leaving her mosque. So I think that's some of the things we, I would want you to speak a little bit more about. And I'm sure, talking. absolutely. And, and let me be clear, I, I want to change the paradigm for how our society views Islam. I, I actively work in that direction with Serve to Unite. Um, one of the pillars of Islam is, is charity and service to other people. And we're illuminating that and shouting it to the heavens. And we're like, this is what Islam's about. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not saying, uh, you know, don't call the white supremacist. I'm, I'm saying let's not call anybody terrorist. Let's stop letting terrorism control our, our cultural conversation mm -hmm. and make that cultural conversation about what's, what's best about our, our humanity mm -hmm. rather than what's worst about it. We can't deny the, the, the worst parts. We all suffer. We all make mistakes. We all hurt each other. Um, but I, I think we have to ask ourselves, where do we want to end up? Mm -hmm. And absolutely, the, the greatest victims of the so-called Islamic State have been Muslims, as well as the greatest resistors. Mm -hmm. Nobody, no, more Muslims have died fighting the so-called Islamic State than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that's lost on, on Islamophobes completely. Um, I have dear friends that, that I love and I've worked with for seven years who are risking their lives to keep us safe from terrorism as we speak, and they're very devout Muslims. So I, I always make that point when uh, Joe Sixpack is telling me, he's giving me these lessons on the Quran about what the Quran says and what it doesn't say. And first of all, I'm like, well, uh, it's interesting that the Islamophobic interpretation of the Quran is the exact same inter interpretation as the so-called Islamic State. It's, it's not the, the, the mainstream interpretation of the Quran. It's, it's these two fringe groups completely bastardizing what this book really means and what it's all about. Um, so I, I agree with you that it needs to be acknowledged that uh, Muslim people are absolutely like double victims here and they're getting attacked from both sides. I have, I have another dear friend, uh, Mubin Shaikh, who was uh, a former jihadist. He had his turnaround after 9-11. It hit him like, this is not what I'm about. And he actually became a counterterrorism operative that infiltrated a terror cell in Toronto that was planning a series of bombings and mass shootings that would have rivaled 9-11. After like almost single-handedly saving the city of Toronto, there was a trial for the 18 guys who were arrested in this sting that he was instrumental in. And during this trial, some of these guys were like arch criminals and they were the ringleaders and they needed to be locked up. They needed to be put somewhere they couldn't hurt people. Some of these guys were like dumb kids who had no idea what they were getting into. Mubin testified according to each one saying, yeah, this guy needs to get locked up. No, this kid should see some leniency. And because he was objective on a case-by-case -case basis, there were very conservative Muslims who called him a traitor for taking a hardline stance on the guys who needed it. And then there were Islamophobes calling him a terrorist for taking a soft stance on the kids who deserved a soft stance. Hmm. So this guy like single-handedly saved the city of Toronto and he gets nothing but hate from all different sides for doing it. That, that's, I think, his personal case is a microcosm of what Muslims are facing throughout Western society and really throughout the world. And that, that absolutely needs to be acknowledged and understood. Um, I, I, and along the way of doing that, though, are we going to do a lowest common denominator or a highest common denominator? Are we going to say, like, oh, those terrorists are bad and so are they, and they're terrorists too, and then there's terrorists over here, rather than saying, 
look, we're all human beings. We all have an equal capacity to harm or to heal. Let's focus on that. Let's stop the people who are trying to hurt people. Let's And then let's try to help them. And then let's look, look at the root causes of why people get involved in these groups. Look at U.S. foreign policy. Look at systemic issues. Um, that It's a holistic approach that has to happen. But I, I'm just I'm wary of, of falling into these traps that I see developing from my perspective. Thank you. Um, at the Carter Center, we have seen that extremism of white supremacist groups or Islamophobia hate organizations and the extremism perpetuated by Daesh as two sides of the same coin. They both see a world divided between us and them. They both see a world that is divided among existential fault lines. Um, in your own academic and advocacy work, what connection have you made between uh, far right and the so-called uh, Daesh uh, groups? Well, I mean, look, both of them work on completely stereotypical sort of Manichaean views of the world, right? Mm -hmm. Good and bad. Every, everything is black and white. Mm -hmm. Everything is a very extreme puritanical position, right? In, in both cases, you have um, manipulations of religious texts, right, that don't represent the majority of people who are in these particular faiths. And in both cases, they seem to be able to find some scapegoat group of people who become sort of the brunt of their twisted visions of, of reality. And so they are very much side, the same, you know, two sides of the same coin. Because this isn't really how the world is, right? It's messy. It's complicated. It's, um, you know, it's, it's actually a wonderful place full of contradictions and interesting things. It's not some slimmed down stereotypical view of, of the world. Uh, you know, and we see the same thing with certain interpretations of Christianity, like Christian identity, that is just an, a twisted interpretation of the Bible to, you know, prove the Jews should be killed, right? We have these mm -hmm. kinds of people in every faith, right? Whether it's Daesh and the Muslim faith or these identity people Buddhists. in Christianity. In you, Myanmar. You, in Myanmar with the justifying the, what's happened to the Rohingya. Mm -hmm. These kinds of interpretations can be found in all religions, and they don't stand in for everybody who's a Muslim, a Christian, whatever, a Buddhist, a Hindu. Mm -hmm. It's just a ridiculous way to look at the world, and it's that simplicity that I don't like, and I think it's that simplicity that's driving CVE programs and some of this other stuff, right, that's that's causing real issues. Uh, well, well, can, can I follow up on that? Yes. A, a, a great point that you're making is that that simplicity is what these violent extremist groups are trying to establish and in doing so they want to speak for everybody in their yeah. in their yeah, group so right. dash is going yes we, we the couple thousand people ten thousand people in the so-called islamic state are speaking for all 1.8 billion muslims in the world if you look at the alt-right the a white supremacist group, yes, we are sp speaking for every white person on earth. We have assumed that, that role. And unfortunately, us in civil society sometimes let them do that. Whether we're letting one group do it or another, anytime we go, well, see, that's how white people are, or see, that's how Muslims are, then then we are playing their game. We're, we're, we're empowering the violent extremist narrative when we do that. Time is up, but I have one last quick question for the both of you, if you can be very, very brief. Um, we have spoken about the polemic rhetoric that we have seen. We've also spoken about mainstream media and its coverage, its biased coverage of issues of terrorism and how it has fueled more uh, bigotry, but also more fear of the other and dehumanization of particular communities. What implementable strategies do you think will help diverse communities stay um, better informed and build their capacity so that they can shape a better role in prevention? Well, I mean, you're hitting on a really important thing, right? Because I don't think the mass media is going to change exactly. sort of its, its deal overnight. And so, you know, my feeling has been, and I've seen a lot of this over the last decade or so, is that when capacity is uh, advanced in MASA organizations, let's say, for example, in the United States, or similar entities overseas, when they speak out for themselves, when they take advantage of the things that we have now, like Facebook Live and whatnot, to get their messages out, and when they refuse to be cowed by stupid messaging coming from governments or unfair positions, that's when you turn this around, right? And we've seen sort of in the travel ban with Trump,
and some of the other anti-Muslim politicking that he's done, that many, many people from that community have come out and absolutely said no. And what it's led to is like amazing moments of resistance in the early months of the Trump campaign. I think one of the most amazing things was the uh, Yemeni shop owner protest that was joined by millions of, you know, white people, Latinos, all kinds of folks on the streets of New York. That kind of imagery turns this media narrative upside down. Thank you, the power of reclaiming Mm -hmm. the narratives. My simple answer is service. And I, I, bit, I, I helped to run Serve to Unite, which people can learn about at serve2unite.org with the number two. Uh, service is a pillar of our human spirituality. All the great faces of the world, or even if you're a secular humanist, the, the act of helping someone who needs it and doing something good for its own sake is, is a very powerful thing. And I think that is the antidote to all these violent extremist narratives. And it's, it's also, a, it, it's a reply to the, if it bleeds, it leads kind of approach that the media has been uh, stricken by for so long. Like, let's change that paradigm. Let's, let's make it known that um, amazing, diverse groups of interfaith people can come together to do beautiful things and have a lot of fun and solve problems in our society. Like, win in the nar- marketplace of ideas against these separatist narratives that say diversity is a bad thing, multiculturalism is a bad thing, um, the infidels are bad, the Muslims are bad. Well, yeah, but we're all here together having a multicultural food fair and raising money to help homeless veterans, and we're having the time of our lives doing it. Like, you can come on over here, too. It, it's that kind of spectacle is you can draw away media f- from the violent extremist narrative and, and let us dictate a narrative of humanity. Thank you very much. So it's service, reclaiming narratives, and intersectionality work that is very much needed. It is an issue that is challenging and ahead of us, but you've given us some hope. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you both.